I'm David Waltzreicher. I teach history at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I wrote a book called Slavery's Constitution from Revolution to Ratification. And more recently, an essay on the controversy around the 1619 project, particularly where it concerned the interpretation of the revolution and its relationship to slavery. Thank you. So I think um, I'd like to begin with the revolution and its uh, relationship to slavery. And um, an idea that you uh, bring up in your book um, of how the constitution's silence on slavery kind of um, hides its, it's a pro-slavery constitution. And if maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that and then um, we'll talk about the three-fifths compromise Okay, a good place to start with thinking about the relationship between slavery and the Constitution is by acknowledging, and not everyone who talks about it does this, is that this is a debate that goes back not just to antebellum times or the Civil War, it really goes back to the beginning. It goes back all the way to, to the debate over the constitution between the federalists, the people who supported the ratification of the constitution and the people they called the anti-federalists who criticized it and said, uh, maybe not, or well, you should send this back and revise it. And that was a very public debate that went on for months. And what the third chapter of my book does is talk about how that debate, debate evolved and then shaped how, how people understood the constitution subsequently. What gets a lot more attention is what happened in the Constitutional Convention where there was surprisingly frank discussion about what various clauses of the Constitution might mean for slavery. And what I do in my book is I, in three short chapters, I talk about the politics of slavery during the revolution, what happened in the Constitutional Convention, and then, and then the ratification debate. And this was an attempt to say that really this is political all the way through. It's controversial all the way through. And it's a three-part process and that you can't figure out just by saying, well, Madison said at the Constitutional Convention that this clause meant this. And thus the original intent tells us that, and Madison wrote, really wrote the Constitution. So it must be what he said. Actually, Madison was already um, a kind of covering his tracks or trying to spin things uh, during the ratification debates, um, like everyone else was, uh, because there was so much to debate in these various clauses, which were um, uh, ambiguous, if not silent, about their likely effects, either on strengthening slavery or on making it possible to end it. And that's why it was so complicated. And that's why it has always been so political and controversial because like anything else in the constitution, it's a license to govern or a license not to govern or it's a license to govern in particular ways that are going to affect the interests of various people. And it's this larger difficulty we have in seeing slavery as something that was subject to politics from the beginning that is really still at work in all these controversies, even the ones that we're having about the history, which seem to a lot of folks to have such huge implications, not just for how we see the past, but for how we see what we're going to do about race and about the status of African-Americans in the present and future. And I'd like to kind of pick up on that thread about how we govern, uh, how the constitution kind of set up how we govern, because it was interesting to me, and I thought that the, um, the idea that the, the Southern states in some of these compromises, um, your point is that it was, it was yes, it was compromising and maybe making it easier down the road to end slavery, but at the same time, it was codifying and kind of institutionalizing this idea of slavery as a way to govern states, as a way to govern, basically, I'll just end it there. Maybe if you could talk a little bit more about about that. And I think the three fifths compromise would maybe be a good way to talk about that. Sure. Um, well, okay, let's start with the, the three fifths compromise and, and how it evolved is quite instructive about the whole process. It's, it's, it's right to start with the three fifths compromise when talking about the constitution and slavery, not just because 
is three fifths of uh, uh, the exact language is escaping me. We should put up a slide at this moment when we when we uh, when we can, when we can get one. And I, I actually have have some that, that I've used. It's not just the three fifths of of all persons not taxed um, are going to be to count in represent uh, are going to count in in representation and thus are only being considered as three fifths of a person. The the offense that that does to any notion of human equality is obvious and quite intentional and it's become very hard for anybody to argue that this is that this was not uh not just pro slavery in the sense of benefiting the people who were in in their politics trying to defend slavery but over the top racist i mean it's, it's practically the epitome of racism for us to say that some people count less than others right or some some people uh, and it's worse than that actually it's it, it, when when we say oh they're three fifths of a person that's that's really just at the surface. What was so insidious about about the three fifths clause was that not only would these people be counted, but they would be represented by the very people by the other people, i.e. the 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 master class, their owners. So they would benefit, get more representation by having more people, and these people would never be able to represent themselves and thus have a vote. So it's it, it made slave owners uh, the most powerful people in the union, and way and and you don't even have to get into the way the other ways the constitution empowered smaller states uh and 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 such and and arguably set the stage for the um lack of democracy in the federal structure and say in the u.s in the u.s senate um the, the, the three-fifths clause uh uh but it's really important to realize that the one of the reasons you ended up with something that was so inegalitarian was not straight out racism it was actually the difficulty in figuring out what representation was all about. During the Articles of Confederation, they had a problem in saying, okay, what, what should be, who, how do we apportion votes? How do we, how is Congress going to vote? They, at first it was, each state has an equal vote. Then, um, but, but, and in the Articles of Confederation, but they had this problem with taxation which was, okay, well, we, we, have to, we have to tax the states in order to pay for this war, in order to pay for the government. You can't just tax all the states equally. You have to tax them in accordance to what? Population? Or should it be wealth? Or is wealth the same as population? Oh, if wealth is the same as population, are slaves worth more than, than free people? Or are they worth less? So then they start to talk about, well, are they worth half? Or are they worth three-fifths? So then they decided on three on three-fifths. And then when they decided to start to come out of the idea of one vote for one state in the Articles of Confederation government, then they, they became this idea that maybe we can use the same logic for taxation and representation. Maybe we can use three fifths, three fifths of the population will be counted. So what does this tell us? Well, on the one hand, you could say, oh, well, all this is an accident. It shows they're not really thinking about slavery. They're really thinking about really important things like property, representation, the structure of the government, the House of Representatives being proportional representation versus the Senate being uh, equal number of, of, of um, senators per state. And that's true. They are thinking about those things and they're thinking about those things first. But the, the revealing thing is that they can't think about those things without dealing with slavery. And the results are not random. The results end up being pro-slavery in ways that the, the founders had plausible deniability about precisely because that wasn't the only thing they were doing. That wasn't what they were attending and they weren't voting up or down on whether to be a pro-slavery or an anti-slavery republic. They were doing things that I argue strengthened slavery in the very structure of government while also being able to argue that well, we meant, if, if you like it, that's what we meant to do. If you don't like it, well, it's an unfortunate side effect. And that's what happened in the, that's what happened in the debates. And um, so I, I guess I wanna, I, I, it would be fun maybe to spend some time thinking about some of the larger implications, which is that uh, maybe this, uh, the way, maybe some of the problems we have in talking about the history of slavery in the past has more to do with debates about slavery in the past than it has to do with how we, how history and politics really really worked. And I'd say the number one thing here uh, is the tendency 
which was taught to us both by pro-slavery and anti-slavery people in the early Republic uh, in debating these matters to try to separate out the issue of slavery like people do in a political debate where they say, well, here's a problem we need to solve or here's an issue we, we want to talk about or we don't want to talk about. Let's make it as simple as possible. Let's make it not about other things. Let's make it just be about this. So slavery is about black people and uh, I think they're oppressed. So uh, maybe we should end slavery or I think, you know, or I think that things are just fine the way they are and you should stop talking about, it. you should stop politicizing it. You crazy anti-slave abolitionists who seem to love black people, stop talking about it. And we're going to pass these new laws so you can't do anything about it. And here we have the path to civil war. What bo but what both sides had in common was a tendency to say that, uh, that the other side is talking about it in completely the wrong way. And this should not be confused with other issues. So the story, the story of the, how we get from the revolution to civil war is the inherent nature of the American Revolution and the government it created to make uh, it necessary to deal with this thing that had been woven into the structure, but which, because people disagreed about slavery's future, i.e., whether it was a good thing, whether it was a bad thing, whether it would just, or whether it'll just get solved eventually or it'll die of its own nature or the, the just way that history is going. Right. I, I, I liken it to like that process to the gun debate today. Both sides are talking about what's going on with with firearms, but they don't want to talk about the root. You know, like the actual both are talking about different things. So they're talking past each other and not actually trying to solve the problem. So it's it's, you know, disc discursively, that's kind of what I see the slave debate also have been kind of the way you described, described it was, you know, they were both trying to convince you that the other side, not the weight of their, their argument was right, the other side was wrong, which, you know, so is, and, is that and, fair? And there is, a, there is a distinctly constitutional nature of both mm -hmm. debates where there's a fundamental disagreement about what is meant by, by certain clauses of the constitution and what they allow or, or disallow. Um, and that's that's um, that's a really that's a really great comparison, precisely because the, the the two sides on the gun debate couldn't be more apart on how they see the meaning of the of the of the Second Amendment. It just couldn't it just couldn't be more different. Um, and that is also true in the uh, the the revived debate about whether the Constitution was pro-slavery or anti-slavery. I, I mean, I'm reading some of my, my my some of my my dear colleagues who I admire their previous works have accused uh, uh, us of being neo Garrisonians uh, uh, and 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 also also for sounding like John C. Calhoun because John C. Calhoun we know John C. Calhoun was evil and wrong about everything. We can all agree on that, right? It's a great rhetorical move to equate equate like liberals and leftists with John C. Calhoun. What are they going to say? Oh no, I'm not. I'm not like that. I'm not a racist, right? But the the notion that uh, um, just that if you say the Constitution protected slavery, you're on the wrong side of history, just like John C. Calhoun. Uh, it, it it just shows you that it's just a, it's a cheap debate. It's a cheap debating trick. Uh, just right. like calling someone a neo Garrisonian without exploring what that what that means, though. Some of us would take that as a compliment. Um, but, um, the reason they say that is because uh, uh, it's actually an old slur that comes from the 50s in the time when the abolitionists had still had a reputation of being dangerous extremists, the, the, sort of like the communists of the antebellum period. And uh, Garrison publicly burned a copy of the Constitution and said it was a covenant with death. So when you say someone's neo-Garrisonian, you're basically saying they're a traitor to the American compact, to the bargain and to the, and to the government that you basically ought to be locked up is what you're saying when someone's, they ought to be run out of the history profession now. If, if it's if now. Yeah. One of the things that I found interesting about um, the, the post, um, kind of when everyone went back to the, the, their states and was trying to sell, they were trying to sell this document to their uh, constituents basically and their local uh, state governments. The uh, malleability of the constitution itself and the way it was written could kind of what you touched on earlier um, be read as both pro and anti-slavery and because of the deliberations being done in secret the debates that we um, now know about weren't common knowledge at the time so is that 
is that part of the pro-slavery constitution that you would argue for, or is that was that less by design? This is where um, there's uh, um, it's funny. Uh, it, it's funny. Some some folks have adopted my argument or my stress on silence mm -hmm. and ambiguity. And here I was trying to make my peace with what was at the time the dominant interpretation, which said that the Constitution um, was ambiguous and thus uh, really didn't become pro-slavery or anti-slavery until it was made so uh, on the on the road to on the road to the Civil War. Uh, I thought it was important to acknowledge that. Um, that the constitution isn't is indirect except for the three-fifths clause and the slave trade clause and arguably the, the fugitive slave clause though though that the, the fugitive slave clause is, is revealingly ambiguous revealingly ambiguous uh, um, about about exactly who is who should be subject to rendition um, uh, um, but uh, there's I uh, I came to be more struck by the ways that the silences work to the advantages of folks who were pro-slavery and that there ended up being something in the American political tradition, maybe hard for us to believe now, but there was that tried to repress and depoliticize slavery and that that itself was foundational that that was part of the, the part of the way that the revolution and the constitution made the American political tradition was, as I put it, worked through slavery, but then then erased it. And I, I think and one of my favorite examples that I'm still and I, 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 I may not quite have this satisfactory or right, but I keep coming back to the way that Jefferson wrote this long paragraph in the Declaration of Independence about about slavery and how the uh, blaming the British for it, and it's the culmination of his of his laundry list of things that the British have done wrong that are usually praised as so cogent and effective, and the Congress, it's usually it's rightly is usually said, uh, erase this. So slavery is not in the Declaration of Independence, though it is there in that last complaint about raising domestic insurrections among us. But if you don't know what's meant by domestic insurrections, which after all can mean a lot of things, you don't know that the British are being blamed for slavery and that that uh, basically the British have done all these things and look, it's culminated in slave rebellion. So you have you have just a just a trace of it there. But really, when when uh, in early seven in early mid 1776, in all the newspapers, it's a main justification for independence, the fact that there's a war going on and the British are arming natives, uh, Americans, and they're arming slaves or thre and threatening to. And that, oh, you know, this is, uh, this is part of what made, uh, created the consensus North and South in order to, uh, to rebel. So they had plenty of practice kind of working through slavery, governing through slavery, doing politics with slavery in mind, but then saying, oh, that's somebody else's fault, or that's not really what's going on here. It's almost a reflex. We don't have to be conspiratorial saying that like that there are that there are John C. Calhoun types who are uh, who are um, really running the show behind the scenes and that and that for some strange reason, these anti-slavery northerners uh, uh, compromised with them or for some strange reason, these anti-slavery northerners were in cahoots with them. Those things may be true also, but it doesn't require that. All it requires is what ought to be a very familiar tendency of, of white people to have race on the brain, but all this, but be convinced that they don't. Right, yes. And that, one of the things that I've been coming across more and more in some of the uh, scholarship since the 90s, let's say, is this idea that the South were just uh, petrified of slave rebellion. And that, the, you know, this is something that's, uh, you know, when I was in school, it was never taught to us. They, you know, they, it was taught that they didn't have this. But it, you know, coming out of the, the Caribbean and then now learning about the British arming uh, slaves or threatening to at least, um, it seems like a well-founded uh, fear. Plus, there were constant rebellions and, and uprisings that just never got talked about in history. 
activists. And, and a, a, a good way of thinking about why this played out the way it did in the sense of um, the American Revolution being a successful colonial revolt, um, mm. but they didn't do it in the British West Indies, right? Mm. Um, is that, okay, that this is like the middle, the uh, what becomes the United States is kind of the middle, mm. the temperate zone of the new world, right? And so in the Northern country, in the Northern air, most areas, you have relatively few slaves, though there's still a significant numbers. It's like, you know, it, it's maybe even more than 10% in Boston, but not in Massachusetts as a whole, right? In South Carolina, 50% or a little bit more. In the West Indies, 80 or 90%, I mean, sometimes 95%, right? In Virginia, 40%. So these, can a place like this, have a rebellion and not have a slave not have a slave revolt at the same time well not really but they can probably manage it and that's what they that's what they did and in the west indies they're saying oh there's no way we can we need the imperial police force we you know we're we'll be vulnerable to raids the other the other side will come and the ship will come in and liberate the slaves and this this we can't do this right and then in the north they're like okay um if we have to choose between giving up slavery and maybe having control of our economy maybe we'll give up slavery, right? But in places like Virginia, it's like, uh, it's all completely contingent. And the and if you, we think of Virginia as being the tail that wags the dog, it's in the middle, Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, just like in the Civil War year, it's going to be Kentucky and Ohio, like the bat, the bat, yes, the battles for the West, the battles for Kansas, the battles for Nebraska, the battles for the whole, the, the whole of California, it's the whole West. But who's gonna really decide this, these questions? It's like the old congressman from Kentucky and Ohio. It's 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 Lincoln from Kentucky. Jefferson Davis is from Kentucky before he goes to Mississippi, right? And and Lincoln is from Kentucky before he goes to Illinois. So it's that's really where, where that's really where the battle is. And so it's the so to get back to get back to my point, I mean it makes a kind of human sense that these people who are in the middle and they don't know what the future is going to be, they're the ones who are going to try to have it both ways. They're not, they're not, they're going to try to have their slavery to benefit from this system while not having to, uh, while not having to deal with the possible moral implications of their, of the, of their politics. They, they want like, we're about liberty. Oh, but we're not about denying other people liberty. So, oh, so, oh, well, maybe they're not really people. Maybe they're not really equal. So that and that's why you start to get these 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 well they they take some of it from some of the cutting edge people who uh, in the in the planters in the West Indies who start to justify it but that's when you get like so it's it's precisely because it's precisely because Jefferson understands equality and democracy that he starts experimenting with racial justifications and the idea that but in the end slavery needs to end but we can't have these people here and thus and we can't solve all that we can't get rid of them so quickly so the next generation will have to solve it. So the, the, those kind of those kind of denials uh, and the, that that weaving of silence is central to American becomes central to American politics, and that's one of the reasons why we're having like we, there continues to be such difficulty in conceptualizing the way the the relationship between the way race worked and the way politics actually worked, because the denials are so creative mm-hmm. and so constitutive. And that's that's was really the larger point I've, I've been wanting to make in my in my on in my ongoing work before I did uh, before I wrote, I wrote a book about Franklin and slavery and the revolution before I that in which this was a major uh, these issues were salient also. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, segues really nicely into the debate about the actual sixteen. I don't even, I don't even know if it's a debate, but the criticism of the sixteen nineteen New York Times uh, articles. And how it seems like one side is being too, they're not arguing facts, they're arguing propaganda. Not propaganda, maybe that's too hard of a word, but they're arguing uh, things that not necessarily are um, genuine, I guess. So um, in the, I can't, I'd have to look again, but there's an art, there's a line in the article about the, uh, the one you wrote about it. Uh, Will Lynch's point, um, 
Yeah, so it's to give the revolutionary, revolutionary ideology of our moment all the credit for anti-slavery is essentially to echo without acknowledgement Franklin and Jefferson's spin into politics, all the more dangerous when it comes to have, when it claims to have all the facts as Willens and Wood do. So uh, could you maybe explain what that and how it might be informing the debate? Right, right. Well, I, I, I think I need, to, I need to back up a little bit because... Um, because you said that that uh, that that one side's not arguing about facts, and it's it's actually, I I think that the debate actually became about who has their facts wrong. That was so. It is we do have to talk about facts, and who has the facts, and which facts are important in order to 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 get at what's what's really going on, going on here. Um, let's so let's um so let's uh let's. There, would one of the facts that Wood uh, brings up that I that I talk about, or what he says is a fact. He says he says no founders said they revolted, that the Ameri that they declared independence, took up arms in order to defend slavery. So the suggestion in in uh, in the some of the well one in particular I guess the uh, Nicole Hannah Jones's introduction, which has been the one that's drawn the most fire from them because it's most about, it, it has more about the revolution. There's really not that much about in the rest of it about that. And, and that's, that's something that's, that I think is, uh, is important. And I felt, I felt a little funny about focusing on that, but that's what the contra that's what was becoming very controversial at the moment that I, that I was, that I was writing this more than hard to believe more than a year ago now. So, uh, uh, and Sean Wilentz uh, made a big deal about the argument that it was the Somerset case in which uh, a, a slave who had run away from their master, James Somerset, was taken to court and, and famously in the Mansfield decision, uh, Chief, Just, uh, Chief Justice Mansfield of the Court of King's Bench uh, said that, no, he couldn't be deprived of his liberty uh, um, that, uh, and, and shipped off to Jamaica uh, while while he was in while he was in England, and this was seen by some folks, uh, especially by anti-slavery people, as a major wedge that maybe would mean that slavery wasn't legal in England. Uh, but uh, uh, now, now without getting into the whole question of what 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 Mansfield really intended and and what the actual effects of it were, which weren't to end really to end slavery anywhere, and certainly not in the colonies. Um, the the uh, uh, I've argued that this was that. I, I had argued, and uh, the 1619 folks had noticed that I and some other historians had argued, uh, and Gerald Horn picked up and took it even further than I did, that um, that the Mansfield decision did threaten slaveholders, it basically because, not because it was anti-slavery, but because of the jurisdictional issues, that it made it very clear that a court in England could decide what the law of slavery in the colonies were. Now, Mansfield didn't say that slavery was illegal in the colonies, but it but it's basically implied that he could say, he, that they could, they could uh, make all kinds of decisions, that there was a politics to slavery, and it might be in the courts, and it might be, and, and, and Mansfield outside of court even said, you know, parliament should really decide these questions. They really should decide what the law of slavery is and not let the colonists decide what it is, not let the local people decide what it is. This is what the American Revolution was all about. Who gets to decide what? B slavery was basic law. It's property law. It's, it's, um, it's governance. It's all these things. And so this was the re whole reason that Mansfield decided to issue a decision was he was a par parliamentary sovereignty guy. And he thought that the empire should, should decide certain things and that that uh, the colonists didn't necessarily have equal political rights. They didn't have, they weren't represented in parliament. That's how the empire worked. And if you didn't like it, come home, don't be a colonist, you know? So, uh, 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 so, uh, and Willent said, nobody, Willent, Willent said, this is, this is outrageous. Nobody can, no, no, the, he, 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 he relied on an old article and argued that like, look, there's no real, in, in something he wrote outside of the, uh, his initial uh, thing, he's, he, he misrepresented the scholarship and said nobody cared about the Somerset case. Now it's debated. Well, we're still we're, we're still talking about how, who cared where, and certainly they cared more in the West Indies, and that's why they bankrolled the the case, the West Indies interest. Uh, that they they knew that this this could have huge because they're the ones who were going back and forth to London all the time. The rich the rich West Indies uh, merchants wanted to take their slaves with them and didn't want to have have these issues. 
So, um, so basically, we have we have these the, this group of historians saying slavery was not an issue in the revolution at all. It had nothing to do with it. And and I and um, I, I think that we've uh, that some other historians, including myself, have shown that it was an issue. It was complicated. It wasn't it wasn't the maybe the the main issue, and it was a lot of people didn't want it to be an issue, but it was still an issue. And and uh, instead, uh, this what I call the the standard or uh, uh, older view is that the only relevance, and Wood is quite explicit about this in his work, the only thing you want to talk about with slavery is how the, the ideas of the American Revolution informed anti-slavery thinking and thus led to anti-slavery. So the American Revolution deserves the credit for, for, anti-slavery, for anti-slavery as opposed to being one episode in a longer story that maybe went in multiple directions at once. And I think this is so important because the, the fact is that the revolution both strengthened and undermined slavery in different places. Right. And, and, th- that, and that the way it did that was not straightforward or complicated. And something, some notion like or- the original intent of the founders or the idea that, you, that, oh, let's see what they said about this and that'll tell us everything we need to know. And these guys are politicians. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they, and they, knew it was, they knew it was a hot potato, especially after, after Somerset. Right. So they're not going to say something straightforward. They're going to be doing. I mean, I, I I use the term spin because I think it's a clear way of making of 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 basically bringing this kind of politics they were doing into the modern period, as opposed to the move that would and to some degree will Lentz want to do, which is to say that these people are like, in our terms, they're like they're 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 existing in this this world before racial politics. It's like they're they're, they're like they're like we we if only we could go back there, right? Like we like right. like it, like. Isn't it wonderful what they did before things got messed up by black people participating in politics? It's like it's it's, it's that's the implication of, of the way they talk about this. It's it's like the white people weren't thinking about black people and black people weren't political yet. Right. And that wasn't the case. That that wasn't that, that wasn't the case, and that's not how the American Revolution happened. And so that's why I I I that uh, that's why I, I I keep writing about this because to me it's a to me like to me we're still having a debate about how exactly to talk about slavery in the revolution and how should our understanding of 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 all this affect how we see the revolution and they're they're short circuiting it for political ends and then accusing uh the historians who have done work on this which they didn't do clean, cleaning up their mess is what i do right, right? what they didn't right. do it we're being political so this is so this is you know it's 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 not that it's not that I want to use the story of the revolution for political ends. I I mean I, I think that I think what they I don't understand the politi- I don't understand the politics of what they're doing. Uh, I think it's it's both problematic both both professionally in terms of misrepresenting the work of other historians and and politically because I, I don't I don't understand what the what the payoff is of of uh, well I guess I I guess I understand it in the in in some of the um, in some versions, is they make it very clear, and it's that this is all too pessimistic about the American past, and will lead us toward a kind of nihilistic politics that always that um, is always about race all the time, and that is ultimately divisive. And I understand that risk, but I thought I've been studying history too long to be confident to know <laughs> what happens politically with historical knowledge, and to think I can control that. That's not my job. That, I didn't think that was my job. I thought my job is to like, you know, like is to figure out what happened using the tools that my living in the, that, that my, my tools of my, whatever smarts I have from living in the present as well as studying the past might have brought. And what I keep seeing is that these don't, people don't look naive to me. They look like Americans. They look like 20th and 19th century Americans. And I'm, I'm just going to flat out say it because that, that's one of the, it's to me, it's one of the clear dividing lines. Why do some people want the founders to be, uh, as Wood puts it, they lived in a different mental world than us. Mm-hmm. And, and, and why would we, why would we, why would we think that? Now, all this said, there were certain moments in what, Hannah Jones wrote and in other essays that seemed to me to be exaggerated and didn't get all the facts right. Like, like, I I mean, I would have said some Americans joined the independent, the revolution or 
fought for independence or advocated independence because of slavery. I might have said like, especially in Virginia and South Carolina and Georgia, for you know, but, and, and they did, they just said, well, that th they just made it a blanket, a blanket statement. But, but, this, but, this is, but this is journalism. It's journalism. It's journalism. Uh, I'm getting an echo suddenly. Are you hearing an echo? No, I'm not. So you're good. No. Okay. Uh, I, and I, uh, they, re, they, the 1619 so, folks reached out to me and some other historians, maybe a little bit too late, and they didn't make all the corrections that they could have made or should have made. But um, given how much of this had not seen print in places like the New York Times before, I thought I thought they did a I thought they did a pretty good job. I was more struck by how uh, you never hear a peep from certain folks about errors in, say, Hamilton, the musical, the the outrageous <laughs> exaggeration of Hamilton's anti-slavery, turning him into an abolitionist. Yes. Uh, Gordon Wood had nothing to say about that. Sean Wilentz had nothing to say about that. My dear colleague Jim Oakes had nothing to say about that. Not that he makes pronouncements about musicals or should, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden these errors uh, uh, that are in the New York Times are more important than the ones that are on Broadway. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Right. And I mean, it's been interesting too how the the political um, aspect of it has been swept up, and kind of in your article you were talking about the the academic debate and being used and misrepresented in some regards by the political debate. So we have a president now, or we did have a president who instituted this 1776 project and we have the 1776 Unites now. And, um, you know, it's just, a, and I think it goes back to your comment about pessimism and, and, oh, this is all so depressing. And how do we, what do we do with that? How does, how does that, I don't want to say combat it, but how do we address it? Or what? What's the? What do you think the underlying move for that uh, politicalness of like we're moving towards that more divisive and not inclusive? Well, uh, um, as far as uh, I think it's it's a shame that the emphasis on 1619 as the origins of the United States. Uh, uh, has come to symbolize a rejection of 1776 and that rhetorical move that that Nicole Hannah Jones made where which was it, it's it, now that's 2021 it's hard to it's easy to forget that it was 1619 because it was the 400th anniversary of the landing of the first ship that that brought enslaved people and that i think that was unfortunate because um well, first of all, uh, it, it wasn't even clear in 1619. It, there's still a there's still a case to be made that um, slavery wasn't necessarily going to evolve the way it did just because those slaves came in 1619. That is not everything there is to know about 17th century Virginia or 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 the colonial period. And so um, the notion of that as the real origins it only has it's only interesting insofar as we have a whitewashed version of 1776. So as if we can't have 1776 be also about black people and slavery. And so I, I'm really bothered by the way now we're being asked to choose between 1619 and 1776. Uh, and because it's 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 completely problematic because 1619 is one moment in the in the in uh, a very very long history of this of the settlement of the Americas, and it's an important one only. It's an important one only if you think of as goes Virginia, so goes America. And I mean, I just reinforced that 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 in, in talking about. Uh, that Virginia as the middle. So there are good reasons to argue that Virginia is the biggest colony and the biggest state in the in the Revolution and the early Republic. Um, so there there are good reasons to set to 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 emphasize that, but it it erases the whole history of the Caribbean and the 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 uh, France and Sp French and Spanish uh, America and 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 the 
it's it's way too narrow a view of of the um, where the United where the Americas come from and and where the United States uh, comes from. So uh, I'm not I'm not waving the flag for for sixteen for sixteen nineteen. Uh, but it is predictable that the response that given the way it was posed, the response would be a doubling down on the notion of 1776 as this redemptive history that is all that is um, where um, that is a caricature even of the earlier version uh, that we're getting. When, and the, uh, I, I took a look at the, uh, the, the, the website you sent me where, where some of the, the not the not uh, uh, Trump's commission, but the, um, the 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 new one with uh, the the self-proclaimed dissenting black intellectuals. Um, I'm not saying they're not dissenting or intellectuals. I'm just saying that I thought that was an interesting an interesting uh, admission or label that they've given themselves, uh, who 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 seem to, seem to be spearheading or leading that effort. And I, I was struck by the contributionism of it. It was like they want to go back to a kind of history where we, where we emphasize the positive in Black history and what what people have been able to overcome. And and there's nothing wrong with that. It's really important, but it it's um, it's not. Uh, it seems to me an evasion, and it's it's a, a, a almost a resegregating of history, not necessarily Black versus White, but kind of positive versus negative. And so, like, let's not look at the bad 1619. Let's look at the good 1776. Let's not look at let's let's accentuate the positive. And this is this is traditionally this is important because traditionally the justification for not talking about slavery in in education, especially with younger kids, but it, it is often extended all the way through high school education, is that it's it's is that it's political, it's divisive, it's depressing. It doesn't give it it, it it that and that even even for students of color it makes them feel bad and it 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 doesn't it doesn't give them stories that are that are useful and empowering and that's what education is for and even and that even progressive educators ought to be able to sign on to that so this is really a debate a lot of this is really a debate about education and it's often a debate about people who think of themselves as sophisticated deciding what is better where people they think of as children or like children are less educated than they. And it's not really about the truth or about history. It's about pedagogy. And it's about kind of um, whether one, th what one wants from history. And, you know, I, I would rather let people decide communities and let individuals and communities decide what they think, what they want from history, rather than saying like, you know, let's debate what you, yeah, it's a debate. What's important is a debate. I'm, I don't think, I don't think that anything should, anything should be, should be should be shut down, but it isn't very productive to 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 take something that where professional historians and 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 up to date scholarship was involved and that that uh, wasn't perfect, but that was based on a lot of good stuff. And to say that and to just say, well, that's all lies and that's all wrong and that's been debunked by by a couple of historians who objected to the the overall message. And that that seems to be what's that seems to be what's going on. But it would be a real shame the the. The debate about the revolution is not just an academic one. It's it's been going on. Uh, it's been political. It's always been political, and it's always been public. And it's always been difficult for historians who specialize it to sort of to try to produce knowledge that is um, is not uh, is not biased or seen as biased, and is not and is useful for whoever whoever wants to use it in in in. Uh, in whatever way they want to use it. But what what I've struck by in this conversation is that um, there's nothing new about <laughs> this debate. And right. to me, the moment of realization was when I, I wrote this book about how Benjamin Franklin's reputation as anti-slavery was has been had been newly exaggerated in recent decades that he'd been made into an abolitionist to compensate for our admission that that other founding fathers weren't uh, were far from it and that you could actually look at his whole life uh, through the prism of the politics of slavery and get a more realistic sense of his dilemmas and what he was about and all of a sudden you understand uh, his rhetoric you understand his issues around labor his issues in his own family around apprentices and control and and his international uh his the way he described america when he was abroad and all these these things and um but the biggest argument is that was that 
you can't look at Franklin and slavery and say, what were his ideas or beliefs? Because he knew slavery was wrong. And that's precisely why he ended up playing the role he played was because he knew it was wrong, but he, but, but America had an image problem. And, he, and enlightened people like him hoped that something would be done about it eventually. But we were, they weren't gonna let it rock the whole boat of the revolution or the, or the new nation. So he support, so Pennsylvania, in 1780, Pennsylvania is the first state to have gradual emancipation. And then when he's back after the Constitutional Convention, he doesn't let it mess that up. But then after that, he agrees to head up the, the, um, the, uh, the Abolition Society and they use his name. And so he has, so at the end of his life, so he has his reputation of being an abolitionist. But, there's a, but the real story is what happens for a long time before that. Okay, so I, I, and I had just gotten to Philadelphia and when I gave public talks around this, you know, it was a tough conversation. People love Franklin in Philadelphia, and um, and uh, a lot of people didn't. You know, some folks didn't want to hear. You know, wanted, didn't want the the complicated story I was telling to be. It was it wasn't uh, what they wanted to hear, or they they found it not not maybe biased, not completely plausible. But when I went on black radio stations, it was they got it in five minutes. It was like, oh, you're saying he was a politician? Oh, okay, that makes perfect sense because. He probably was a politician, and we know we know what politicians sound like when they deal with issues like that. And this isn't this you know this this makes a lot of sense. And oh, we don't have to hate Franklin. We just we don't have to say oh he, instead of being our savior, he's the devil. He was just a politician. It was like it was you know, so. What that taught me was you know that like a uh, that a lot of people in this country don't see our history and have not seen our history. Uh, in that uh, way that Gordon Wood sees it for a long, long time. He just hasn't been listening. Right. Is to be yeah, I think so. And so this shock comes really from having to listen to Nicole Hannah-Jones and her version of history, which she very eloquently and clearly says in the, in the long extended essay is that she's engaging in a conversation with her father who was a patriot, but who was also very critical and who had experiences that did not undermine his his awareness of how America had let down uh, he and his and his loved ones in his uh, his communities. Yeah, and to me that message has been completely buried under the fact that she maybe got a couple sentences wrong. So I mean that 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 optimism I think is where the for me that's the foundational document for the whole series of articles. But again, it's very hard to show that to people who are more intent on discrediting it or making it some somehow more political than, than well, necessary. And the, the, it is it is true that the logic the logic of the entire project does go straight toward the logic of reparations, mm -hmm. and that and that so it, it and that is not that's not something that's hidden. It's it's quite it's quite palpable. The, it's the economic benefits of, of of slavery leading to the economic benefits of segregation and public policy in the nineteenth and twentieth century and to and all the way to the present are are. Um, I mean, but this is this is a, a mountain of historical scholarship that that it's that it's based on, and as well as um, stories that weren't hard for the, for a lot of the writers to just take out of their families' experiences. So uh, I don't have the answers for that. So to get back to um, how do we how do we deal with the pessimism? Well, you know that's our that's our I don't know I don't know, uh, but that but I don't think um, I don't think evading it uh, is is really is really the answer. Um, but it, it um, there's nothing new here in terms of what, what what's new is that is the extent of how politicized the, the, the more distant past is. It was kind of cordoned off or segregated. Yeah. Um, and the, 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 the kind of the, the try, claiming the story from the beginning all the way to the end, right. as opposed to slavery equals the South. Right. The old South, the antebellum South, or Jim Crow. 
It's way more complicated than it's way more complicated, but there's also a, my my colleague Jim Oakes calls it the new consensus history because there's a yes. there's a, also a, a simplicity to it, the saying that there is this consistency and and uh, that maybe not that much has changed, and that is incredibly powerful as an argument for as an argument for change, saying things haven't changed as much as we think, and all this is you know I mean all this needs to be seen as um, the overconfidence that that having a black president. Was a sign that everything had changed, and then the the uh, what seemed to be undeniable that some a lot of things hadn't changed because uh, and, and a lot of things hadn't changed, and that there seemed to be this backlash in in terms of the uh, electoral results, and those two seemed to be connected, and that's how that's how we get here, uh, uh, and that. Um, one of the things that was really, uh, I'll just, I don't know if we have time to talk about this, but I think it's useful to think about how um, the, talk about, the, there was a lot of talk about the founding fathers among the, for conservatives and Republicans in the 90s and the 2000s and um Suddenly, Trump was elected, and he never talked about the founding fathers. Mm -hmm. Never. It was so striking. It was so striking. I mean, he didn't even he didn't he wasn't even interested in originalism. He just asserted he would just assert things like the Constitution says I can do whatever I want, not like our foul, foul founders that were like you know. But he, that was the only reference ever to the like. Okay, so I, without getting into like whether the, what why he did do that or just didn't have the capability to make those kinds of historical arguments, uh, it's almost as if the fact that it wasn't there that much has licensed some people to say that history is suddenly getting politicized or the founding is suddenly politicized or, or how we talk about early America suddenly is being warped in ways that are that are that are political whereas you know it's just a kind of odd odd blip that for, that that it wasn't there at the center but it's actually in, in so many of the moments leading up to it including the way that, that uh, Obama uh, an ex-constitutional lawyer, had his own spin on progress, and he, you know, the, very much the liberal idea that you know we have this great constitution, but it didn't solve all our problems, and we have to keep refining it. It was textbook, um, it was it was textbook liberal constitutional law, and in his his great speech that made him a candidate uh, that he gave at the Constitution Center, and uh, um, when he was a candidate. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I, I think it also, you know, it's also been leveraged as a like. Um, against communism, against socialism, against... So during the Cold War, the Founding Fathers mythology was very much more uh, politicized, I, say, I think, in that like the we had to tell the story so that we could combat this other competing narrative that was also kind of around at the same time. Yes, it, it, it's very much gone in waves. And uh, one of the waves that's not, not sufficiently appreciated now is that... Um, uh, Charles Beard in 1913 wrote the fam famous book about the um, yes. yeah. the economic about the economic origins of the of the Constitution, and he was uh, lambasted by the right wing of the day, including this uh, this newspaper editor in Marion, Ohio, named Warren G. Harding, who <laughs> uh, put headlines in his paper saying. Uh, um, how this 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 liberal New York this this left wing New York professor had said these terrible things about our founding fathers, and that is the first popular use of the term founding fathers. I don't even like to use the term because basically Warren Harding, who was basic, who was a who uh, not coincidentally was a was a corrupt right winger, <laughs> rode this this kind of idea that that reformer that anti business quasi-socialist reformers were doing these terrible things to our past. He rode that all the way to the White House. Yeah. So there were like, so like, so like, right. so basically we've had a hundred years of um, 
professional historians, newspaper people, and politicians riffing off each other. And sometimes it kind of, sometimes it sort of explodes onto the scene in this way. And uh, the controversy around Beard and the Founding Fathers and debunkers versus then uh, traditionalists. Um, and then, you know, and then, uh, you know, by the time you get to the 30s, you have FDR and the Democrats decided, oh, we have the solution. Jefferson is the usable past. He was he was a real Democrat. And, you know, at a time of segregation, nobody nobody was talking about Jefferson and slavery. So they they built the Jefferson Memorial. And then they build the Lincoln and then, you know, so then they're ahead. So there's like, oh, you know, maybe we can do Lincoln, too, you know, and they get away with that, too. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, so it's it there's uh so uh, so okay now we've now we've gotten onto memorials i know we don't have time to deal with that right no i'm not, not, <laughs> not going there that's right well i just wanted to uh i think this is a good place to leave it we could go on for all afternoon but uh i think this is a good place to to leave the interview uh, so thank you again um this was amazing and i think uh it really will uh, help us with the 17 framing the 1776 1619 debate